So in this third day of the risk assessment, uh, risk to resilient assessment uh, uh, training, I'm going to start with module seven, which is uh, assessing risk management options. And then I'll talk you through developing an implementation plan so that you turn this, these solutions into actual actions. And finally, designing a sort of reporting process so that if you're working with a forest and farm produce organization over a long period of time, each year you can take stock of things that you, you have solved, remaining challenges that you need to solve in years going ahead, um, and, and, and you can begin to uh, build up the capacity of a forest and farm producer organization to do regular business planning. And that's, that's vital because any business that is staying still is, is probably going to go out of business. So we need constantly to be looking at challenges and taking new opportunities, taking new risks. And finally, at the end of the day, we'll give you a little bit of homework, which is to try and develop a risk management plan. So you've got your three top risks and we'll, we'll give you an assignment about, well, what would you plan to do to address those risks at the end of the day. Just as a quote to start the day, um, it's often, I think, the case that people become paralyzed because they don't think they have the capacity to do things. Um, and I like this quote because experts are people who are just as stupid as you and me. They've just had more experience in making mistakes. But there are always new mistakes they haven't tried yet. <laughs> so that was by Hans Rosling. As I think um, we make progress and we learn when we take risks and we try to solve problems. So let's, let's not be put off. Uh, everyone can do these sorts of uh, analyses and make progress in business. So let's start the day then with a look at assessing risk management options. Um, and if you remember the toolkit, I hope you'll have had a chance to download this toolkit and have a look at it. We now come to the heart of the cycle of risk management that you see. This is an annual cycle. We've We've gone through the steps of introducing why we want to do this. We've reviewed our objectives, identified risks and ranked the risks. And now we're agreeing among the team, what are the risk management options that we need to put in place? So I hope that's clear. So this is module five of the toolkit. And this is it just described in a different way, a little bit clearer. So we're at the point of um, assessing how we can manage some of these challenges that we've identified um, and which you've identified yesterday afternoon. Oops, let me just see if I can move this forward, good. So, the way to do this in practice, once you've done a risk ranking exercise with a team of people, and again, I mentioned it's good to have a team of people that has some people from management, but also some people from the farm or the processing unit or the sales unit. Um, you can convene a, a business planning meeting and put up the results of the risk ranking exercise. So you will have ranked your risks into red category risks that really we have to deal with this year. And then maybe some lower categories of risk that we've also noticed, some challenges that we've noticed, and we may decide to deal with them or not, depending on the time and resources we've got. Um, it's always good to start this discussion by checking that everyone in the group is happy with the highest priority challenges that you've prioritized. Because um, we had an interesting example in our group where somebody presented their homework and somebody else chipped in and said, well, have you thought about this as well? Surely this is a high risk. Surely climate is a high risk if you're doing avocado production. Um, and so it, it's always useful 
to check that everyone's happy and that you haven't missed anything. Um, and so start with that process. Then once you've got your list of prioritized risks, you need to brainstorm one or two things that you could do to improve the situation. And th this is a very simple process. You, you ask what needs to change for the situation to be improved. So for example, if you were in a dry land region in Northern Ghana and you had uh, suffered from drought, you might think, well, what would need to change? Well, we'd need to have um, maybe put in a borehole or have access to water somehow. Maybe we'd need to have rainfall catchment and have water storage for dry season irrigation. Or maybe it's just that the crops we're trying to, to uh, use in our business are no longer suited because of climate change. And so we have to think of a complete shift uh, to, to a different crop. So you can, you can discuss one or two things that you could do to improve the situation. Then think, well, how would that change come about? What actions might we need to, to consider? So if, for example, you want to drill a borehole, and this is, um, this is a, 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 an issue that was faced by a Zambian, um, the Choma district uh, tree nursery business that Vincent will be aware of. One of the problems was that in the dry season, the seedlings were dying for lack of water. And so they needed to put in place a borehole to, 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 to be able to water the seedlings. Um, what, ch what change, to, for that change to come about, what actions did they need to do? Well, they've got various links to supporting organizations who might be able to help them pay for the, pay for the borehole. Their, their nursery business is sited in the forestry department's land. Maybe the forestry department could help them. There's the forest farm facility project. Could we, could we approach them for some money? So there, there are actions that you might need to consider to solve your, your risk. And then who, is, who are the main actors who would enable that or prevent it from happening? And, and what are some examples you could think of, um, of people elsewhere solving their problem? So think of, of similar uh, businesses struggling and maybe even go and ask those businesses, how did they solve that particular problem? And by doing that, for each of your risks, you'll have um, a set of changes that you might be able to put in place to improve the situation and some idea of who needs to get in contact with who to make that happen. Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to try and take you through um, a whole set of uh, tips for de-risking um, some of the challenges that are faced uh, in each of the six areas. So I'm going to start, you remember we had those six areas, we had sort of uh, finance was the first one, natural resources, business relationships, um, I can't remember them all. <laughs> um, uh, what was it? Business relationships, uh, policies and legislation, um, brand reputation, and I've missed one. But I'll cover all of these, some tips for de-risking. So in terms of finance issues, often finance issues come about because the group uh, doesn't have a really well-managed account that belongs to the business as a whole. So you might need to, to set up a transparent accounting system, maybe even opening a bank account. If you don't have access to a bank account, sometimes a savings and loans, village savings and loans box can, can set up. Make sure your treasurer is on top of the finances that you have. Um, it's, it's very rare for people to give you money without any financial track record. So often you have to establish a group saving system at the start to allow you to invest. So people might put in membership fees or you might agree to contribute a percentage of anything you sell into a group saving system that will allow you to invest in what you need to invest in. 
when you have some sort of money um, uh, available to you, it's often possible to ask buyers if they could provide some credit to, to you. And the reason a buyer will do that is because they want to make sure that they can get a supply, a reliable supply of product uh, of high quality. So by talking to your buyers, you might be able to get some kind of joint investment, especially if there are slightly bigger things like putting in place processing facilities. The buyer might be willing to go half half with you on that and come to some deal for paying that debt off if you ask them. Of course, you can search out finance organizations or project donors. And if you want to do anything more elaborate, and some of the partners in this room are trying to do sort of more elaborate proposals with careful costings and profit forecasts, that are submitted to a bank for finance. That's a longer road because the bank is often very um, uh, suspicious of, of smallholder forest and farm producer organizations and their ability to repay debt. So you do need to have a very good financial track record. You need to have a bank account that showed a profit for several years and so on before you can really get a bank to, to to play, play uh, the investment game with you. And there are other things you need to think about as well. Make sure you're not paying too much tax um, if you're registered as a business, thinking through how you register the business so that you pay uh, 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 the, the least tax you can get away with, uh, essentially. So there are various tips for de-risking finance. And just as an example, um, this is a, a cooperative and you, if you go into the um, uh, uh, conference report, the workshop report that I've put in the day three um, shared folder, you'll see the example of this cooperative in Indonesia. And essentially they were a, a community uh, living in a, in a forest area. The forest had protected status but they were allowed to, because of their indigenous status to grow coffee in the understory of that forest. And they had a number of risks when they did their risk assessment, they had a number of risks to do with uh, staff capability. They had laws and legislation that prevented them from pruning the coffee plants as they would have liked. Um, but one of the issues was that they needed to uh, store the coffee in a, a better way to get a higher price for it when they sold it. And yet they didn't have the money for, a, um, for, for building a store. And so the, the management team of this cooperative decided to develop a, a business plan and submit it to a local finance organization to try and get the money uh, for them to be able to, to store the coffee. And you can see that they've also been investing um, quite heavily in the packaging of some of their products. So they've got uh, sort of honey, uh, uh, bottled honey and, and vacuum packed uh, ground coffee. So they've, they're beginning to develop slightly sophisticated production processes and they've got a bit of a financial record, which is why they're able to solve some of their financial problems by going to a bank and getting a loan. So I hope that's a helpful example. Now, uh, let me move on to the next one. Then there are many problems to do with natural resources. Um, and we'll cover a lot of the natural resource issues to do with climate change and the options for that in the following two days. So I'm not going to dwell on those. But some of the risks that you, you, uh, many of you have mentioned are, you need to make sure that your group is big enough and has enough members with land to get production volumes that it's worth the while of buyers in more distant uh, city markets to, to come and buy from you. And that's because often local markets are very good starting point, but the prices you get for those from those local markets are often low. To get to the 
more lucrative markets in cities and urban centers, you need bigger volumes, better quality, uh, more processing, and you need members to do that. So you need to build the scale of your natural resource area. Um, in many areas, uh, the, there's a, a question of simply expanding on-farm production. So this is um, a, an area in Burkina Faso um, where they're producing Shia butter. And they had to get agreement from the people who were owners of the land to enrichment plant with Shia butter trees. So they increase the volume of production that way. Um, developing procedures for sustainable management for members. So this won't apply equally to all sorts of businesses, but for example, if you're running a honey business and the way people are collecting honey is to cut down the tree, you probably need to think of, you know, a more sustainable um, way of introducing hives or um, uh, developing procedures for harvesting the honey from trees in ways that don't damage the natural resources. Similarly, if you're collecting rattan or non-timber forest products from, a, from a, an area of forest, you need to develop procedures to make sure that what you're taking out is not greater than the, the natural resource can sustain. It's important to be able to share some of the natural resource challenges. So getting your product from the field to the market can be a big issue. It's, it's sort of a natural resource issue, um, but sharing transport, finding ways of sharing transport is, is, is important. Um, and then there are often political issues to do with land tenure or transport or registering community forest management plans that are, are, are overly bureaucratic or don't favor smallholder groups. And the way to do that is perhaps to link your group into a farmer's federation that can present your challenges to the policymakers and try and change things over time. It's usually not something that happens quickly. So it requires, you know, uh, you need to become associated, you need to collect evidence of what the problem is, you need to present your case to policy people who you might know and gradually build momentum for change that way. And then there are, there are simple tips like protecting your resources. Um, often uh, th this is something that can be done um, communally, um, like uh, putting in fire breaks, uh, introducing live fencing or other fencing to protect from animal damage. Um, where you've got areas which are particularly prone to violent storms, you can introduce sort of tree breaks to protect uh, crops from, from storm damage. Um, uh, landslides, other things like that, you can introduce um, sort of uh, tree crops into your fields to improve the way in which um, the resources are protected. So, um, there are many different ways you can, you can address these risks. Here is an example from Ecuador of a bamboo business. It used to be a cattle ranch, but the owners decided that bamboo was um, better business. And, and so they um, uh, needed to uh, try and supply a construction market for scaffolding and bamboo, woven bamboo, um, sort of fencing, I think, was their main market in, in Ecuador. Um, they also needed to treat the, the bamboo uh, for pests and diseases for those markets. So they had a legislative issue to deal with as well. Um, but when they started, they didn't have enough uh, volume to meet the market demand. So the big buyers were going elsewhere for their products. And that's why they decided to, to develop a, a sort of a more um, plantation type system for bamboo. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's a really huge uh, bamboo crop, this one. And they also um, got their members to diversify into other bamboo products. You can see some of the crafts and things they were trying to develop 
so that they could diversify their markets. So expanding the scale, the membership, and, and the amount of resources that you have uh, to offer the market is often a useful way forward. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, customers. Your customer is king. Um, you, you have to be meeting, you have to be producing something that somebody wants to buy. And so it's really worth investing in a little bit of market research to find out who's selling the products you're trying to sell in the market and who's buying them. And then uh, develop a bit of a customer pipeline. You know, go and meet people, ask what, what, what you could supply them um, and so on. With customers, um, often you, in, if you're in a rural area, you're often dependent on traders who come in and they often play people off against one another. They make it competitive. Well, we'll only buy for you if you meet this price. And if not, we'll go to your neighbor. So it's, it's really worth trying to sell um, as a group to customers. And to do that, you often need to develop uh, working capital so that you've got a bank account with some money in so that you can buy the product from your members so there's no delay for them in getting their money and then when you sell the product you cover the costs and maybe even make a bit of a profit which can develop this working capital even more. Um, customers invariably complain about quality. Quality is probably alongside price is what they're looking for. So if you've got many members making a particular thing, um, I don't know what that might be, but if, if you were developing baskets, for example, and you've got many weavers, it's very important that you develop quality standards so that any regular customers know that when they come to you, they're going to get the best quality. And that can be as simple as writing down the procedures for, for production really clearly and agreeing them as a group and pledging to follow them and so on. Uh, then there's, uh, you know, customer problems, sharing useful equipment and, and knowledge to ensure good quality. So if, if somebody has told you and you're a farmer and somebody has told you that they don't really like buying honey from the cooperative because it's uh, not very good quality. So they've come to you, a particular farmer that they know has good quality. Um, well, please share that knowledge. So have meetings to share knowledge and intelligence so that you can improve the quality and, and sell as a group. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize one last time, sell as a group, don't get caught into selling as individuals because you'll always get a lower price. Um, often people uh, get a deal from a buyer who says, I want this product on, at this time. And then you think we can do that, but you, you fail to get the order to them on time. And that will play absolute havoc with your buyer's business. If your buyer is trying to sell something in a shop like a supermarket, and they need honey on their shelves, but you haven't provided them with the honey, they have bare shelves and they're losing money. So you have to meet orders on time. And then developing your market contacts, you might be able to get your NGO supporters to work with you to do a bit of market research and find people, find tourist outlets who might be wanting to sell honey, go to the hotels and so on. So don't be shy about using um, uh, partners. <clears throat> Here's an example um, from Cameroon of a fish smoking business. And um, it's a mangrove forest business. So the fish are sourced from, from mangrove inlets. And um, at the moment, each of the uh, producers is uh, smoking their fish because it provides a bit of shelf life and, and, and then selling it by the roadside. So this uh, cooperative was thinking, how can we do better with our customers than that? Uh, perhaps we should uh, develop guidelines 
for particular stove designs that really give a good flavor and a consistent quality. Um, maybe we could package our products together and put a logo on it so that if people are buying from a roadside store, they, they come to us again and again because we develop a reputation for good quality. So, so that was some of the issues they were thinking through about how to improve um, their customer relationships, their business relationships. Now some, some quick tips to do with uh, bureaucracy. Um, there are almost always policies that provide a headache for businesses. And sometimes it's just the number of steps you have to jump through in order to register a business or a community forest. Sometimes it's transport regulations. Um, and, and often these things are just poorly put, thought through. So when you're trying to deal with policies and legislation with government bureaucracy, they will very rarely listen, decision makers very rarely listen to individual farmers. But if you join an association, and particularly if you join a, a federation that represents tens of thousands of farmers, um, and those farmers are all facing the same problem, you can share information about those problems, collect the evidence, and develop a, a, an advocacy strategy. It's also really helpful if at the apex level, you have somebody who regularly goes and meets um, people who you know are on your side in the policy world. So it doesn't have to be at ministerial level, but if you've got an apex level organization, it might be, it might be people in, in forestry departments or agricultural departments who can help you, who can tell you who's in charge of this policy and how, how could we change it. And I think one of the things that people don't do enough of is um, forest and farm producer organizations don't have a communication plan. They don't show how important their businesses are for the lives of many, many people in rural areas. They don't show how those forest and farm producer organizations are managing forest and farm sustainably, how they're contributing to youth employment, how they're helping women. And developing a communication plan can be really helpful when you're going to try and get government support uh, for changing a policy. The other issue is that often um, these issues have to do with uh, internal conflicts. You can often get internal conflicts within your group that undermine your case and, and stop people cooperating together. So have a, have a conflict resolution plan. You know, have a process for hearing people's complaints, putting them before the management team, and then providing an answer. Even if the answer is no, you can't, we can't change this, have a conflict resolution plan so that people know that their grievances can be listened to. Um, let me give you an example of a, a policy and legislative challenge this was um, faced by a women's group in a community forest um, area in Nepal. And what they're doing is they're producing juice from the wood apple. It's a particular type of fruit you get in the highlands of Nepal. And they were facing several policy and legislative barriers. The first was that the uh, transport regulations for forest products were very ambiguous. So when they got to the checkpoints going towards the main city, Kathmandu, sometimes government officials would let them pass saying that's fine. Sometimes they'd say, oh, this is a forest product and, and you, you haven't obeyed the, the rules on producing, um, you know, you haven't got the right permit. So they had that issue. They also had the issue that it was very difficult for them to register their business the processes were, were very long and complex. And um, the, the third issue they had was that they had to meet food health and safety standards for their juice, but the only office to check on the quality of, of juices was in Kathmandu in the capital city. 
So they lobbied through their federation of community forest user groups called FECAFUN for the government to set up quality assessment um, stations in more regional locations and also to develop a one-stop shop for, for registering businesses belong, belonging to community forest groups. So that's a battle they, they fought over many years. This was the area I forgot in, in my um, introduction, and this is risks to do with staff capacity. What are some of the things you could do? Well, the very first thing you should do is you should have a clear organizational structure where the people who have responsibility for different things have clear descriptions of their roles. And then you need to ensure that those who know how to do particular bit things within the business, say somebody knows how to filter and purify honey, train all of those who don't know how to do that. <coughs> if you really don't know how to do something in, in a business, um, it's often useful to um, visit, do a peer-to-peer -peer exchange with a functioning business that is doing the same thing elsewhere. So that can very quickly solve, solve your staff capacity problems. Or if you have some farmers who know how to do stuff and some farmers who don't, then think about a demonstration plot where you can have a teaching center for people who don't know how to, to I don't know, whatever it is, for, uh, cultivate crops or mix crops and trees or process the, the, the product in some way. It's really uh, helpful when you're dealing with staff capacity, if you deliberately rotate the leadership positions and roles so that uh, the, the business manager doesn't remain as the business manager forever and keep all that experience to themselves. But actually you have a limited time period for which they can be the, the leader and then you put somebody else in the role. The reason for that is that the business, the old business leader or the old treasurer or the old secretary will then provide a sort of a, a, a source of advice and information and, and, and so on to, to build experience within the group as a whole. So that if one person gets sick and dies, the whole business doesn't collapse. You've got other people who've already done that role and can step in again. And when you've got equipment and processing equipment, um, don't wait for things to break, but get the people who know how to run the equipment to make sure that there's a spare store with the most, the most likely things that are break and have an inventory in that store. And that can keep a business running and make sure that new people understand how to run the equipment and machinery. Um, let me just see here. Uh, so this is a, a cooperative in, um, in Brazil and it's very remote and it's trying to sell Brazil nuts and timber and a fish called Arapima, which is the biggest freshwater fish. You can see the man uh, carrying one out of the water there. And they had all sorts of issues, uh, disputes and internal tensions and capacity gaps. Um, and, and mainly that was because uh, people didn't trust the leadership, that the, the, the leadership weren't really being very clear about how the business was being run. And so that when they did a risk assessment, they identified that capacity problem and set up a process of developing organizational goals and then staff roles and responsibilities and a list of business objectives and so on, so that they could deal with their staff capacity issue. Um, and in, in that case, they got the local NGO to provide business leadership training as well. Um, finally, some tips to do with branding. Um, so here is the uh, candle nut. A branding that I showed you in an example on a previous day. Um, some tips to do with branding. How do you distinguish your product 
from other similar products? How do you make buyers buy from you rather than from other people? Well, it's essentially a brand is about telling a story. And in order to tell a story, you have to say not only that the product is good and the product is high quality, but also that the production process is beneficial. So you might want to develop a strong environmental and social commitment in your business and processes that include attention to sustainability, maybe even participatory guarantee schemes for sustainability, so that when you label your products, you tell a story, not only is this a high quality product, but also the production process is benefiting the environment and benefiting the communities. It's always good to assign someone as a market researcher to go and look at similar products, what else are people selling, and then <clears throat> come back and, and see how you can compete with, with the other things people are selling. This is often a role that works really well for young people. Um, I don't know about you, but as I get old, I'm complete, increasingly um, flummoxed or bamboozled by technology, whereas my daughters are, are experts at it. So get them to do the computer design for a new label or the, the internet marketing. Um, and try and use a strong logo and imagery that communicates the, the values of your, of your business. <clears throat> Trying to have meetings and action plans um, to do with branding and marketing is, is also useful so that you, you don't get stuck. You can, you can change your branding and change your image uh, if, if you think that'll help you. So here is an example from Indonesia, where we see um, a native bee species, it's a stingless bee, spe bee species, being used to produce honey. And so they did a risk assessment and they looked at the problems. They, were, they had to design special beehives uh, to accommodate this particular bee, and they had to share knowledge with their different members so that everyone was producing high quality honey and they had to uh, do filtration. So they developed a filtration process for each of their members to make sure the quality was good. But then they came to the issue of branding <clears throat> and, um, and they wanted to be able to sell their honey in a supermarket. So they got some of the young people to investigate who produces bottles and jars and which would suit us in terms of volume and size. What about price? And they developed a, a printing, a printed label, and they managed to find a business that printed labels exactly as they want it. And you can see on the label, there are various certification marks to do with um, honey quality, um, local origin, and so on. Um, so <clears throat> there are various solutions there for uh, branding and, and um, customer reputation. So when we're developing risk management plans, you've seen some of the options. What we have to do is we have to take our risks. So do you remember when we looked at the, that uh, teak business yesterday, there was a, a challenge. The customers will not pay enough for our timber. Maybe that's been ranked highly. And so you then have to come up with an action that will form part of risk management actions. So we could improve our quality standards by buying a high quality sawmill, try to get certified and find new buyers who will pay more for our timber. Or we can't pay our staff enough to keep them in our business. We can improve the salary, but only if the members agree to meet these quality standards. So we, we, we're going to develop quality standards for timber production, if you're a member, you have to abide by them. And then we're going to invest together to, to have a quality sawmill and try and get certified so that we can get better price and then we can pay our members more for their timber. Do you see what I mean? So you're developing an integrated action plan that is tackling your top ranked risks. And I think I've gone on 
for, for, for a little bit too long, but the other sessions will be a bit shorter. So please do now, let's stop for 10 minutes and just have any questions on developing a risk management plan, risk management options and developing a risk management plan. So please do raise your hand if you have a question while we're waiting for people to do that. Kata, are there any um, questions coming in? Um, not questions, but um, two comments. One from Mark um, on the issue of or in challenges related to access to resources. So he's saying in the area of land and land use, the local and or a specific cultural context and arrangements around land acquisition or ownership is a very important area to consider. Usually building relationships with local community leaders and landowners is a good entry point. Yeah. Mm, and then Kanimang um, is also making a point here on uh, how branding needs to go along with getting the brand listed with the property rights units in the Justice Department in the Gambian. And that's that's a very important point, Kanimang, and thanks for raising that. And, and this is another area where if you are thinking like a business incubator, how can we support our groups? The, a group in a rural area is probably not going to be aware of where the brands are listed within the property rights unit of the Justice Department. So as an incubator, you can make that useful comment sorry that you can make that useful link on their behalf and support them to get their brand uh, formally registered and listed so that other people can't copy it <laughs> um, and steal your all your good reputation so thanks Kenny Mang that's a great comment do we have any other questions about any of the options that I, I put up of some of the things you can do to respond to some of the risks that you might be facing. I obviously haven't had time to cover all of the ways in which you can solve challenges, but I was just trying to give you some, some ideas for thought. So does anybody else want to just chip in um, with either a question or a comment? Or have I reduced you to silence on the third day of the training? <laughs> yes, Mark, thank you. Not at all. I think we're just um, <laughs> taking in all what we've heard. But I think there's a, a risk that I think you touch on related to technology and how mm -hmm. technology can be applied to support. And I think throughout the three days, you've mentioned issues around uh, how, for instance, equipment can become um, a response to some of the risks that are identified. Um, I think clearly also one of the things to do with uh, technology is the fact that it is constantly evolving. And so maybe an equipment probably you buy today, maybe mm -hmm. in the next three years, is probably not the best equipment to be able to um, support the business. How do you plan um, and have this in mind Towards responding to this fast changing uh, space in the technology uh, sector? Thank you. Yes, um, that's a really good question. Um, and, and yes, equipment is evolving over uh, all the time in, in almost all areas of business, perhaps less fast in agricultural processing, but very fast in internet sales areas like that. Um, so, I mean, I guess. An important start point is to have somebody in your group who is interested in and capable in sort of either heavy equipment or in uh, information technology. Um, and as I mentioned, that's often younger people among us who are interested in, you know, new ways of doing things. And it can bring a bit of excitement into the um, business group if you suddenly reduce everyone's workload by installing some new equipment, or if you find a new way of selling product online or something like that. Um, in terms of planning for it, um, 
people often treat equipment as a as a one off cost. Um, so they save up for the equipment and then they uh, buy it and then they don't think about the future. Um, and I think it's better to think of equipment as something with a depreciation so that you set aside in your group finances every year a little bit of money for investment in equipment so that when the old equipment either becomes outdated or breaks, you've got a, a, a fund that has been specifically set up based on membership fees, annual membership fees, or deducting a percentage of the product from each thing that's sold. And some of that money is used um, to cope for the depreciation in equipment and the need to keep updating with new technology. So that's a really good um, question. And we'll cover that a little bit on the last day when we, we talk a little bit more on accessing finance. Um, yeah, I'll try and cover that point a little bit more. But thank you, Mark. Have we got any other questions? Does, does any of the, do any of the uh, tactics or tips that I offered jump out at you as particularly important? Um, Yes, Kanimang, please do. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Duncan. Uh, related to capacity uh, issues, capacity risk, especially if uh, some of the members, some of the executive members stay very long in their positions. Uh, uh, those issues are very relevant for, for FFFPOs. So I think one of the issues uh, uh, to address uh, capacity issues in terms of governance is to use uh, that uh, model which was developed during phase one called organizational capacity uh, uh, assessment tool. Yes. This is very, it's a very good tool for FFFP to look at uh, their own capacity in terms of uh, uh, technical capacities, uh, uh, group governance uh, issues, so that toolkit is very important, of course, to support that process. Thank you very much, Duncan. Good. Now, Kanyman, can I just ask, is that, <clears throat> was that a, a, a short checklist, the OXAT checklist, or was that a slightly more developed yes. tool? Yes. Yeah. No, it is, uh, actually, it's, uh, it's also related to the OSCAT uh, uh, checklist, where normally, for us, we apply that OSCAR tool if, uh, uh, FFFPOs are going for before they go for national congresses so that they assess internally their own capacity related to some of those parameters on the Oscar tool. Yes, Thank okay. You. Well, listen, I will, I will um, try and uh, dig out the OXAT uh, checklist tool. It's a sort of a, it, like Kanye Mang says, it's a really good way of quickly looking through um, the various capacities and systems that a good business organization should have in place and then assessing well where have we got gaps and that can help people think oh yes we haven't got um, a system in place for staff recruitment or we haven't got a system in place for um, you know uh, regular labor um, uh, consultations with our labor force um, so you go through and you tick the ones you've already you've already got in your organization and then you think how to improve in the future. I'll see if we can get hold of that and I'll put it on the shared drive or, or get Ali to email it to everyone later on. Thanks. Thank you, Kenny Mang. Um, any further questions or points at this stage? There was a comment um, by Nila um, on the, the importance of research um, for any business to, to stay viable in a sort of changing environment. Yes, uh, thank you, Nila. Um, I think that is, that is an absolutely fundamental point that um, unless you know what your customers are buying and what other products, similar products exist, in the market with which you're competing, it's very difficult to survive in business. So you have to be, try and be ahead of the game. 
you have to be trying to do things better than your competitors always. So introducing new designs for baskets or using different color schemes or putting things in, if, if, if customers are worried, they don't want to buy a big one liter jar of honey because it's too expensive. You produce your honey in 500 milliliter bottles. And then the, the people who are not so well off can afford to buy the honey on a, on a more um, sporadic basis. So doing customer research is, is a really important fact, uh, a, a part of, of business. And having somebody in your organization who's given the role, you're responsible for market research. Um, go and talk to our customers, find out what it is they like about what we're selling, find out how they would like to see it changed, come back with ideas about other products that we could sell. Um, that's a really important role. So thank you, Ndila. <clears throat> good. And good morning, Isifu. <laughs> morning. Welcome. Morning to everybody. Sorry yeah. for my being late. Okay. That's absolutely fine. We're, we're aware that everyone is, is, is busy, busy. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and Mark has just mentioned the point that when we're doing um, research it is to get customer feedback. Um, so if you've sold something to somebody, go and ask them, did you like, did you like our product uh, or did it break? Um, did you, when you tasted our, our food, was it good or, you know, and they may say, actually, you know, really, you need to wash the pesticide off or something, something simple that you can then change in what you're doing to in increase the way customers think, oh yeah, they're really taking care of us. I'll go back and I'll buy my product from them because they're reliable and they are, they're interested in, in, in what I think. Um, so very good point, Mark. Good, well, in that case, um, let me uh, push on. Donald, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say something. Thank you again, Duncan, for the nice presentation, but I was just wondering concerning the, maybe you did not mention, but I was just trying to think in about the, uh, the health risk. For instance, now we have the pandemic, like the issue of COVID and all that. And if I remember very well on, uh, on the first, when you try to explain, when you want to develop the plan, you have to brainstorm. But my understanding these issues, for instance, the issue of uh, COVID or something, any other pandemic, you find that already they have uh, uh, a regulatory authority which actually gives out like what are the action you need to take. Now, when you are developing a plan, do you need to uh, to just take as the way the recommended the recommendation are made by the authority in place, or you can also try to see how you can uh, develop more in order to make it fit for the current situation. Thank you. Yes, that's a very difficult question because I don't, I don't obviously know um, what the COVID regulations are in all the different countries. I know that forest and farm producer organizations have really been struggling with this, um, getting product to market, um, uh, selling it um, in, in ways that are socially distanced um, has been a real has been a real challenge and, and different country groups have come up with different solutions. So I remember in, in several countries, I think in both Nepal and Ecuador, people had developed home delivery systems. So they had uh, people able to uh, try and buy uh, vegetables or something um, and have them delivered to their home so that they didn't need to go to the market. And then you have a sort of a box which is brought and left on the doorstep um, and some way of paying. I, I don't know the details of it, but I guess you do have to abide by the rules the government sets. And it's a question of, well, can we think of innovative ways of uh, delivering our products in ways that that meet that those those restrictions um so I'm, that's not very helpful um because i'm not aware of all the situations but i'd be interested you know to hear 
perhaps from others uh, if if they've got particular solutions to COVID. Um, maybe people could put uh, in the chat anything that they've found really is helpful as a strategy for, for the challenge or the risk of COVID. Thank you, Donald, that's really good. And just to remind us of that major, major risk <laughs> that's affecting us all at the moment. Um, well, let me move on then, and I will uh, uh, try and get back to the sharing. Um, can you all see this? So we're now um, going to take you through uh, two slightly smaller uh, sessions, one on developing an implementation plan uh, for your risk management, and then how do you monitor what progress you're making and making that monitoring of progress part of the uh, risk management process. So um, we're, we're here in the, in the cycle of risk um, assessment and management. We're in module six. And we're really, we've, we've got our risks, so we've, we've ranked them. We've come up with some actions that we think would be a good response to, to get us ahead of the competition. And now we have to assign responsibilities um, for taking those actions. Um, and it's really important that, that uh, within a group, everyone knows who is tasked with um, who's tasked with the, the solution so that uh, there's somebody, somebody is, is going to make something happen differently. Um, so this is where we are in the, in the process. We're getting towards the end of the uh, assessment and risk management process. And we're going to talk about uh, risk management plans and assigning responsibility. Now, before I talk about um, that, I just wanted to step back and say that business organizations always develop over time. And they often um, uh, go through a set of phases. They don't all go through these phases, but, but they often do. So th the first step at the bottom is, is th the business is formed, the business organization is formed. And people don't really know whether to trust one another. And, and sometimes the business is set up by a particular leader and that leader is, is, you know, there's no process of election or decision making on the roles, who's going to do what. And so the other members uh, think it's an interesting idea, but they don't really own the business or, or its activities. And sometimes um, women or minority groups are excluded. It's, it's the people with the land and the resources who tend to dominate the establishment of, of group businesses. Um, so this is the forming phase. And then there's quite often what we call a storming phase where a storm blows in and um, trust breaks down for whatever reason, usually because the accounts, nobody understands how much money the business is making, or the leadership has, has, has put some of, used some of the money to buy a new motorbike. And so at that stage, trust breaks down and the leadership adjusts, people, people say, we need to do something differently. All the activities stop and you lose a few members. Um, but if the business is a really good idea, um, it's possible to, to kind of save a, a business like this by going through the next phase, which is norming, which is introducing written norms that, that govern how the forest and farm producer organization will function in the future. And these adjustments restore trust. So there's a written process for selecting and removing leaders, 
how you take decisions within the business within the business organization who's who's has what roles and so the the members who who used to be a little bit feeling a little bit isolated they now have regular meetings and they begin to own the activities and feel like they belong to this cooperative or this association and because it's 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 growing it's a, a a trusted thing the membership then grows and it matures and and finally as uh, we go through the risk assessment and management process and solve some of the problems we gradually improve the business step by step uh, each year identifying challenges that we need to solve and improving the business and finally you get to this performing stage where there's strong trust between the members. There are routine changes in leadership and staff that happen without any conflict. People are eager to, to kind of belong and to meet the quality standards and they're making good profits and there are the women and minority groups are included. So the community as a whole is represented and is happy. And at that stage, you, you've got a mature um, business organization. And I don't know what stage you find yourself at, um, but it's worth persevering and risk management is a way of, of helping to move from uh, a, a very weak organization to one which is much stronger. So let me give you an example of that. Um, this is a business I was trying to help um, in Belize, and it's uh, run by a Mayan community who have a community forest area. And it's a very beautiful um, area. There's a, a valley that the community is based in between two sets of very steep cliffs and limestone cliffs, and they have a community forest and some farmland. They wanted to add to their farming activities by running an ecotourism business. And so um, they decided that the business was going to sell just the tours. They weren't going to try and build accommodation. They were relatively close to the coast where tourists are visiting the beaches. And so they were going to run tours and they, they had two ideas, two main ideas. The first was that they had a a cave system, which I've explored, which was more than five kilometers long, had beautiful stalactites and stalagmites. And secondly, they had a river that was running down through the valley, through the forest. And they thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we put tourists on rubber tubes and got them to pay for a, a tubing experience? And they can also see some beautiful flowers and wildlife as they go. And so they, they named their business Adventures in the Lost Corridor and everything seemed fine. Um, the, the problem was that the leaders who set up the business were mostly men. You can see them in the foreground and they belonged to one of two main clans within the community. And what they hadn't realized is that they hadn't discussed the river tubing experience with the local community and and where they had proposed for the tourists to float through included the women's uh, bathing area in the river so the the other clan and the heads of the community shut down the business so they had formed the business and then there was the storm <laughs> the storming phase um, but they didn't give up. They decided that they would um, reconstitute the leadership of this business because it was in the community's interest. And this time they had half, half women and half, half men. And they introduced the idea of also selling traditional meals, uh, Mayan meals to the tourists halfway through the day. And that was a, 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 a thing that the women could, uh, could contribute to and earn money from. And so you went through a process of developing uh, procedures for, for, the, for the business. They also had a lot of permits to get. So they needed a, a permit to be a tour guide, you need a permit. And if you're doing a caving expedition, you have to have 
proper health and safety equipment and, and health and safety guidelines. So they were uh, still in the process of, of developing their, their business when I left, but at least we'd reestablished trust and we, we got to the norming stage. I don't think it's fair to say that we were yet at the performing stage with that business. I hope that that helps. So managing risks and having a, a risk management plan is part of developing your business. Now, any business should have uh, clear staff roles. So you should always have somebody who's, a, who's the manager. Um, you should have somebody who is uh, responsible for all the supplies you need to run the business. You should have somebody who's controlling any production process if you're processing anything. And you should have somebody who's responsible for marketing um, and somebody, of course, who's responsible for financial records. Um, you may have many other roles and each of these, if you have a very large forest and farm producer organization, each of these roles may have a whole department of people underneath it. Um, but you should think in your head, if we're going to assign risk management tasks, we need to know who best to ask to put those things in place. So if you're trying to deal with financial risks, maybe the person to deal with that is the finance manager. If you're uh, dealing with staff capacity to grow a new crop, you maybe it's the production coordinator. If you uh, have uh, something to do with policy and legislation, maybe it's the business manager who needs to take responsibility for the actions. So when you're developing a risk management plan, you know, it doesn't all have to be done by one person. You can assign different tasks to different people. Um, when I'm running this training, I sometimes ask people to identify who the business manager is, who the supply coordinator is, uh, who the, the accountant is, and so on. Um, so the accountant is the person on the left, that's in a business in Ghana, um, the marketing manager, um, that's the second person, um, the business manager is the person in the center, and then you have um, the supply coordinator on the right, and, and the lady there is the production manager for a Brazil nut collecting business in Bolivia. So just you know, different people have different skills. So when you're assigning people to solve problems, make sure you assign the right people. And the way to do this is really, again, if you're having a risk management process, you've ranked your risks together, you've brainstormed what your solutions and actions might be, and then you've got a sort of central management group uh, linked to the core roles, and they're gonna put some time and energy into this process um, and perhaps help to secure resources for the process. And, and you need to have a commitment to repeat this whole process if it, if it proves positive and decisive. So when you are assigning tasks, think of doing it in an open way, Think of uh, having a group that is responsible for following up and chasing each activity and, and think of a commit, making a commitment to do this on a regular basis. Um, and that's because keeping the members trust is key to any forest and farm producer organization business. You can see in the picture, this is one of the ladies in Belize who is now running the uh, adventures in the Lost Corridor. And at the start, she didn't trust the business at all. She thought they weren't listening to them um, and weren't taking into consideration their concerns. But now she's, she's in the management team itself. Um, so you need to have an in, an, uh, the integrity of the management group is, is really important. And a risk management process can be seen as a way of building that integrity, listening to people's risks and challenges, their concerns, what's giving them a headache. Honest, 
being honest about what we're going to solve this year, what we can't solve this year. When you have an action, actually following up on the action, trying to make it fair and develop these good relationships that make a forest and farm producer organization run well. So it's worth, if you've developed a risk management plan with a set of actions, each an action for each of your priority risks, that you have fairly regular meetings and follow up. Um, is this, is something being done about this? Why, why has this not been addressed yet? Have you visited the city to ask whether there's an expert in coffee processing we could, we could talk to? So it's important to have some kind of regular meetings to follow up. And um, yeah, you, 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 might, you might want to formally register your business and, and part of formal registration is having a business management plan, which will require you to have a risk management process within it. So it may be a legal requirement. Um, if it isn't a legal requirement, then sometimes it's worth building risk management into the bylaws that govern the running of the forest and farm producer organization. So we're going to annually, we're going to have a meeting where we look at the challenges for the year ahead and we're going to assign people who are responsible and so on and you can write that into the bylaws um, and and having transparency so that um, any costs associated with this uh, these actions are are clearly presented um, to the board of or management committee of the business so clarity um, builds trust in risk management you you have to um often when you're thinking about um uh risk management you can think in terms of who has what rights who's responsible for making any change what relationships are there that need to be adjusted and and what it, what do people get out of making those change what rewards are there for doing um these things um, so if you're assigning somebody with a task, how are you going to reward them if they do that task and improve your business as a result? Um, if you're trying to change something, does it affect the rights of the members? Have they been involved in the decision making to, to say, yes, we want to put in place this new machine or whatever? So just thinking through um, when you're doing risk management, those four R's, rights, responsibilities, relationships, and rewards can help you avoid some of the pitfalls that you might face. So here's an example of another ecotourism business. That's the, the second of two ecotourism businesses that I'm going to um, just give you. And um, I wanted to describe what they were before. Before this ecotourism business, uh, they were a very small community forest group, um, a relatively small area. I think it was something between 25 and 50 hectares. And their community forest was high in the mountains overlooking a, a city and on one side and a very beautiful view on the other side. And when they started their business, they were going to sell chickens, a little bit of pine timber that they planted and some agricultural crops. Um, when they had a, a process of management meetings, one of the young people in that business said he'd noticed that lovers, uh, sort of uh, young couples from the local city used to like coming up to the community at the weekend because there was quite a good road and they would hang around at the top of the mountain and take photos and because they had that regular set of meetings the management team said okay well we'll assign you with responsibility for uh seeing whether we can turn that into a into a money making opportunity and the young people thought, well, 
wouldn't it be great if instead of just taking a photo through the trees, we created some um, platforms where people could take photos. So the, the platform in the center where people could take photos and we could charge them a small fee, like half a dollar or a dollar for every photo they take. And we could get a, a photographer um, uh, to do the digital photos for them in case they wanted somebody to take their photo. Um, and so this was the, the start of what turned out to be a very lucrative business. They developed five platforms. They developed um, stunt photos. So that the, the photo on the right is using a bungee cord in case you fall out of the tree. You could do these action photographs with you and your girlfriend. Um, and people would pay maybe $10 for all of the different um, photo opportunities. Now they were, they were, I think they were getting an average, uh, people were spending an average of about 10 or $20 per visit. And they were getting 20,000 visitors per year when I saw them. So you can quickly see that by having a, a, a risk management process, a regular risk management process, assigning responsibility for somebody to investigate how we could do something different, you can completely change the fortunes of your business. And that's, uh, I hope that's a, an interesting example. It's not something you can do everywhere, but it's uh, worth uh, doing. So make sure that your risk management process is clear to everyone. Don't let a risk management process um, just be part of the management team alone. Make sure that you communicate your findings to the members um, so that you, you have it approved by the members. Make sure that the board know that this is what you're going to do and make sure that the management staff who've been assigned with the roles for, for implementing any solutions are clear on what they should do. And getting much more practical, um, you, can, you can simply en enlarge the table that I showed you before. So you've got your risk, the challenge you're facing, you've decided to uh, an action that you're going to take. So you're going to try and buy a high quality sawmill or try to get certified to find new buyers. Maybe the first step this year is to improve the quality standards. So the people growing teak will all be doing planting at the right spacing, doing uh, weeding, doing uh, pruning, so that the quality of the timber is uniform. And you've assigned somebody on the management team to develop a quality standard by 2020. This, this slide was from a few years ago. <laughs> And similarly, for each of these challenges, you've, you've, uh, you've assigned somebody. So somebody is going to provide training in the quality standards for members of the cooperative by a particular date. OK. So I'm going to stop there um, and take any questions that you have on how do you develop a management plan? and some of the issues of how do you manage a risk management process. I hope I've been trying to communicate to you that risk management can form part of your regular business processes and it can enhance the trust and it can help to solve problems in a way that allows your business to flourish going forward. Um, do we have any, any questions? Let me stop the sharing. Um, and see whether people. So, and, and I'm very happy to welcome Niagia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, who's joined us from, from Ghana. Um, so welcome to the training and I hope you can get access to the training materials um, uh, online or through emailing uh, Ali Logan Pang, who's on this call. Um, I've got one, another comment from, oh, Niadja, do you want to say hello? Hi. 
<laughs> yeah, so we've been trying to join since Monday. We have not been successful, but hopefully I'm here with you and I'm enjoying every bit of it. Great. Well, very much welcome. And I hope you'll be able to see the, uh, the presentations from the last couple of days and so yes. be able to catch up. That's yes. wonderful to have you. Um, and I know that uh, technology issues um, are, are always a problem with these sorts of trainings. Somebody indeed, Ndila, from, um, has, has mentioned uh, that online marketing is one of the methods used in these hard times, I guess COVID in particular, but it remains a technology gap to some groups. Um, and that's, that is a real, um, a really good observation is if one of our challenges is, is market access and getting our product to our customers, um, how do we do that when COVID is restricting transport and, and there are rules on, on all sorts of things? Um, and indeed some groups within the forest and farm facility support have been developing online marketing, but it does depend on you having sufficient money and resources to make that possible. So a group in Ecuador developed a website um, where all of their farm products were advertised. And then you had a click, uh, you, you, you ordered, you did your order and payment online to the cooperative. And then they had a, a little delivery van that traveled around the city near where the uh, farm or organization was based and delivered product to all the people who'd ordered and paid for it. But that obviously depends on you having that sort of uh, technology. Um, and it would be interesting to, to know if anybody here is experimenting with online marketing as a solution. Does anybody have any experience with online marketing in the groups they're working with here? Does anybody even use the internet to advertise their products here? Or is that still something that's not being developed and used widely? I'm sure some of the Ghanaians must be using the internet. Elvis, are any of your groups using the internet to market products? Hi. Hi, Mark. Uh Yes, so, um, I can speak for one of um, GAFAP FFPOs that are already working in that area. Um, that's to do with um, Kambauku. And they have um, um, an existing relationship, um, even up there with um, Aduna. Uh, Aduna is um, a British business that is working um, closely with um, smallholders with uh, Kambauku. Uh, in the Baobab value chain. Okay. So there's a lot of things um, being done online and Aduna um, is a major off taker and they use a lot of online uh, marketing. I think Kwame Tichi also wanted to come in. Thank you. Yes. Kwame, do you want to come in and add to that? Yeah. Um, we are also using um, the internet in various platforms. Uh, we have uh, one ecotourism center uh, in our village that we are trying to develop. And uh, most of the event that happens around it is posted on, on the internet. And we've already mapped the whole site also on the, on the net. And uh, we are also into uh, Mango, the largest production company. In the Obono East region, most of the farmers are into Mango. So we are also working with uh, this company called HPW. And most of the events, trainings are also available on the internet that you can have access to. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you Kwame. That's, that's really helpful to know. And, and I also saw Vincent, your hand was up as well. Yeah, uh, actually I wanted to check for the Petauke District Farmers Association because they've got so many products and they've been using WhatsApp uh, messaging to share what they, but I didn't see Hosea speak but uh, maybe he expected uh, 
other definition of uh, marketing online. But even WhatsApp messaging, which they've been doing, I think is part of a similar kind of message. But they, and Facebook. But we'll see, I can't see him anymore here because they have a Facebook page for Petake DFA and they, they advertise their products a lot around that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and it's it's um it is it is something really to consider. Um yeah, Niadia, you've you've uh, um put your hand up. Um yes, um I, I I mean I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I'm asking a question that may already have been asked in the previous uh, training sessions, oh uh, but I, I think that's relevant today. I'm just wondering, is there, are there guidelines for helping um, forest and farm producer organizations to always find the silver lining in every dark cloud? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really, uh, that's a good question. It's a very broad question. I mean, I think um, what we're trying to do um, with our support program at the forest and farm facility is to provide long term support to uh, forest and farm producer organizations to develop both their production systems and their businesses and yes. link them to policy makers. Um, and so I don't think they always we always provide silver linings, but our intention is to to give confidence to people that they can do this, that farmer groups, forest and farm producer groups all over the world are developing uh, accountable, well-managed groups that do good business for, for their members. And, and this training, I hope, is, is, is one element, the risk management process that we're outlining here. If you do it regularly, you'll see, um, you'll be able to see yourselves solving problems and, and improving in an incremental way, step by step, the business will grow from something that isn't very professional and very well run to something where you've solved a lot of the problems within it and is functioning very well. Um, but it's not a silver lining and some of the challenges that people are mentioning to do with climate change and drought, um, political barriers and so on, they're long-term issues that we have to work on. So, yeah, thank you for your point. Uh, Duncan, there was, um, Ndila also uh, mentioned that uh, the groups he's working with um, also share product information through WhatsApp. Yes. Um, and Mark um, asked a question on what you would suggest uh, would be a good way to um, to review performance of these various responsibilities assigned. Okay, okay well, that, that question is will be answered in the next session when we talk about monitoring um, and, and assessing um, the, the, the risk management plans that a, a business might develop. So I'll come back to that one. And I'm also seeing, um, uh, question from Anani: Does the website created for advertisement re is is re really relevant in our contest? Looking at its costs, where most of the small FFPO members, to which no one of the members is literate, and haven't got a technician that would help them. So some FFPOs do selling in the COVID context via WhatsApp platform and advertisement through rural radio. That's really interesting. So I I agree that. If you haven't got a young person who's been to college and understands how to develop an internet site, I don't know how to develop an internet site, um, is it really relevant? And more relevant might be to use what everybody seems to have these days, a mobile phone WhatsApp group, and then to advertise the products by radio. So thank you, Anani, that's a really useful suggestion and just keeping it real for some of the context we're dealing with. Um, and then uh, Nixon has said some of the FFPOs in Tanzania have market information systems using mobile phones and also sharing product information on the internet. Um, and, and 
Damien also says, yes, we have that as well. Uh, Damien, do you want to just add anything there? Yes. Um, <clears throat> yes, we have a, a market uh, information system to our organization. We call it Kulima uh, Poto, uh, where we have uh, uh, not only market information system, but also our farm inputs uh, uh, information are also shared. Okay. So we have uh, 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 like four components. One is, uh, is information sharing, but also a farmer can actually get um, market information where they can actually interact with the system and ask uh, what price of maybe maize in which region. And, okay. uh, but another, another thing is where the, the, we, we as an organization, if we saw an opportunity somewhere uh, where farmers, they can maybe sell like honey, we just share straight away to the farmers and then they get, and that is market linkage. But, and another component uh, in this is about uh, the farm inputs. Uh, we can also give information on how and where to get um, the farm inputs because we have also challenges with the, with the genuinity of the farm input. They are counterfeit, uh, counterfeit uh, farm input. So we give okay. also information, such kind of things. So you yeah, keep also quality. Also some other things. Yeah. Um, uh, another uh, important to the system is uh, this system is also can be also used with a normal mobile phone, not necessarily a smartphone, uh, because we consider most of the farmers that are in the villages they cannot even have mobile. I mean the smartphone mobile phone. So the interaction is also uh, with the normal uh, cell phones. That's really helpful, Damien. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thinking with a business incubation hat on that we talked in the first day about how useful it is to think, well, if one group is developing business, then it, it's, it's probably able to help other groups develop business. And if you're an apex level organization, providing market information, ideas about who to sell to in ways that local farmers can access is a really useful um, service that you can provide as, as an incubator of business for people. So thank you very much for, for that contribution. Um, now I'm going, to, um, I'm going to move on now because I'm aware of time. So we'll just cover the last Thing that responds to Mark's question about do are there useful ways of assessing the performance of a risk management process and and indeed there are so let me share um, my screen one last time for today um, and and so this last session is if you want to make risk management assessment and management a core part of your business incubation and a core part of your business, um, then you probably need to do it on a regular basis, maybe once a year, run a process with the members of your organization. And you need to have assigned tasks for people to try and solve some of your priority challenges. How do you then check up on uh, what's been done and what's been achieved. Um, so that's the, the final module of the Securing Forest Business Toolkit is about how do we monitor a progress? How do we assess performance um, using Mark's term? So this is getting us to the end of a, an assessment and risk management process um, that would happen once a year um, but most of the activity will happen between assigning the responsibilities to different staff members and then the next year when you start the cycle again. So how do you monitor progress? Well, the first, again, stepping back a little bit, um, any business uh, should be uh, keeping records. 
um, because keeping records is is probably the, the the first and best way of improving a business. So you you might have a business plan that describes what the business is aiming to do, who the management team is, what the production processes are, uh, has some sort of financial information, and and it's important that whoever is managing that business plan, usually the manager of the business itself, um, regularly reports to people on, on what is happening within the business and what changes are being made. And that might include changes to do with risks that have been identified and actions that have been agreed to be taken. Obviously, you should also have some kind of finance uh, records and and these should involve at the very least some sort of balance sheet that shows what money was put into the business what money has gone out of the business and so you've got a balance of uh, which allows you to see where all the money lies and it should have at least a profit and loss account which tots up how much income you had how much cost you 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 incurred and so whether the profits are more than the costs. And also um, you need to have at least at the start some sort of cash flow analysis, which shows when money is flowing into the business and when you have to pay for things in time so that you know that you've got enough money to pay for the things you need to pay for like salaries or like equipment. And the treasurer is usually responsible for that. Um, sometimes businesses keep a record of their customers, who paid for what, what are the contacts for the customers, any feedback, and probably the marketing manager um, is, is somebody who could do that and keep a record of those in, in Microsoft Word or some other, prod, uh, some other computer product or just written on, on sheets of paper. And Somebody should be taking records of the decisions that a business takes, um, planning meetings, including the risk management meeting. So the secretary should keep a record of what was agreed in the risk management meeting. Finally, perhaps the production manager would be keeping a record of any inputs, uh, any stock that's held in a store. And so you, you, you can only, um, measure progress if you're keeping records and a business should be keeping a number of different sorts of records. Um, and that will be important when we consider how we monitor progress. So for example, um, the, I want to give you a negative example for once. This is a rubber tapping cooperative in Bolivia and it was set up by the, the men in the bottom left. And um, they established a business based on a, a, a natural forest reserve where they were uh, going around the forest and certain trees produce latex, rubber latex, um, and they were taking it and processing it. You can see some of the equipment on the right, which has all gone into rack and ruin. What they didn't realize is that they, um, in their business was that they hadn't got any financial record keeping. So they'd agreed with the rubber tappers a certain price per volume of rubber, but actually that price that they were going to pay to the rubber tappers wasn't enough to cover the sales, the income from, from the sales. Sorry, it was too much. So the costs were too high and the sales price was too low. And so after a few months, this business just collapsed. So that just gives you an example of the fact that you do need to have some basic records over time that help you to manage a business and to manage the risks within it. And if you see the costs creeping up, then you need to think, well, either we need to sell our product more expensively, or we need to find a way of reducing the costs. You can only do that if you're keeping financial records. So how do we, how do we monitor progress? Well, again, in general, um, groups, forest and farm organizations tend to have a big annual general meeting. Um, and that 
usually is about to report any progress, to, to show the accounts, to vote on any leadership positions, and to propose or change any, any systems within the business. Um, and that can be a useful place where you present a risk management plan. So you could say, well, we, we looked at all our challenges and these are the four things we're going to do this year um, to, to, uh, to make a change. And that way, everybody in the farmer organization knows what's happening. They knows what you've prioritized as the main challenges, what you're proposing to fix and, and what you've agreed to do in the year ahead. And so having the, the risk management process just before the big annual general meeting is quite useful. But you should also be having, probably the business management team should be having regular weekly management meetings. And that can look at the challenges you've identified and any progress um, that is being, being made on a more smaller level, like have you phoned the right person? Did you find out the price for this yet? Um, have you uh, contacted the Federation to see whether we can join the Federation? Did you get the rules on COVID from government? Those little decisions can happen at a weekly basis. And so here is a, another example of um, a, a business. It's a Shia Butter Cooperative, a woman's cooperative in Burkina Faso. And it has 5,000 members now. So it's quite a substantial undertaking. And because they had such a large membership group, um, they were able to offer quite large volumes of uh, Shia butter to the market. And you can see the Shia butter nuts and the traditional way of pounding those nuts on the right. It's a very labor intensive process. And then the process for separating the, the Shia from the from the waste products in, in it's, a, it's done by hand and it has to be done over many hours. And so when they looked at their risks, they decided that their challenges, they decided that they needed some equipment because there were so many women doing this and the quality was so variable and uh, it, was, it was such a, a time consuming process. They decided to in invest in new equipment and two types of equipment they wanted to invest in. One was a, a, a grinding machine to grind up the nuts rather than doing it by hand. And the other was a machine which was like a big stirring machine that separated um, the, the oil from the, from the waste. Um, and, and that challenge uh, was, was presented at an annual general meeting and an agreement was reached that, yes, they were going to invest in this. So the membership, because they had a large membership, the members could put in enough money to pay for those machines and they got a matching grant from a non-government organization. Um, subsequent to that, They've also uh, developed other products. So they recognize that just selling raw shea butter was not very lucrative, but they could develop other products like um, soaps. Uh, you can see different types of shea butter soap and nice packaging on the left. And then on the far left, they've got various body um, skin creams and massage oils and various other products. Um, and, and so, what they did is they had a risk management process, a regular process of looking at their challenges. They come up with some solutions. They present those solutions in an annual general meeting, and then they um, action them over the next year and report back in the next year. Um, and that's hopefully the way this should function. And with that, I'm going to um, just stop again for any last um, uh, um, discussion, uh, maybe on the particular thing of how do you um, monitor progress and perhaps more generally on the use of this tool, how you might use this and repeat this training with your groups. So let me stop the sharing there and see if we have any um, quick questions or comments, either about 
what is the best way of checking up on and monitoring the performance of the risk management system and or otherwise do you think you could um, go and implement this toolkit with a group that you're familiar with and help them to work through identify their challenges and come up with some actions to solve in the year ahead And I'm aware I've been talking for a long time. So <laughs> thank you for being patient. Any, any questions or comments in the chat? Not that I can see, Duncan. Okay. Mark, can I ask you, did that, did that short presentation help answer your questions? Yes, yes very helpful and also very structured uh, in a very detailed um, analysis of how we can respond to the various aspects. Okay. Um, maybe just uh, to also add that um, one one area that, for instance, we probably would focus also on is the the leadership and 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 how um, the leadership also um, is building on its capacity uh, to be able to respond further um, to these um, key areas, because obviously there will be some capacity gaps that um, as the business is moving on to scale, the leadership, especially the management would require. So understanding same and planning against how to respond to uh, same would, would be very uh, a useful pro process to think around. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, all of, as, as a business evolves, it always needs new skills and new capacities. And, and some of those capacities are in leadership. Um, and Kani Mang's just very helpfully written the comment, you know, if you want to track something, you need to keep simple monitoring form sheets. And I probably didn't make clear enough that that, that table I was, I was showing you, just a few lines of a table where you have the risk you've identified, um, what your proposed management solution is, and who's responsible for that for what time, that can be a simple um, monitoring checklist um, so that the management team can say at the end of the day, okay, um, Mark or Kanimang, you've not yet done this activity that you promised to do. Um, so Johnny's asked a question, who is responsible and how is, is, is done this monitoring? Is it a person or is it done by a team? And I guess once you've, you have a broader team to do the risk assessment, come up with the solutions and propose actions. But then it's up to the management team of the business to monitor um, what progress is being made, whether the people who've been assigned responsibility have done it. And I think, you know, different management teams will have slightly different composition, but that should be part of regular business planning from then on. So if, if a business usually has a meeting once a week, I would say at least. Um, so once, once you've agreed those actions, you can check your little sheet, your simple monitoring sheet on risk management and say, okay, have you made progress in this area? Have you made progress in this area? Because there'll be many different risks you face and many different people assigned to do something better. Um, and in dealer, you've said backstopping is very helpful by those who are assigned to monitor progress. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, especially in smaller um, forest and farm producer organizations, having the business manager help uh, you to uh, find the right contacts and implement the solutions can be really helpful. Nixon, I can see your hand. Uh, yes, Duncan. Uh, what I want to share is that in your presentation, uh, you mentioned that in the management, there are marketing managers and the treasurers who can take part in the risk management. But uh, on the experience, most of the groups we are dealing with actually are at the level where they have no managers and the treasurers, but they have uh, you know people in their groups who are well experienced who are taking those roles as you know managers as treasurers though they're not professional managers. So maybe our law will be able to equip those people to take now the law of risk management. Though by professional, they're not treasurers or they're not managers. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nixon. And, and that's a really valuable point because I think you're absolutely right. In a farmer context, of course, the local people won't be professionally trained managers or professionally trained treasurers. And so it may be quite difficult to find people who can play those roles. The manager is usually the easy one because somebody will have a natural authority or a, a, a customary position that makes them in charge. It can also be a risk because if you don't have rules for changing those regularly, that customary leader might then abuse their position of power. But finding the other roles, the marketing person, the, the, uh, the input coordinator, the treasurer, the secretary, usually those are people just maybe one or two people who are literate and so can take notes or somebody who's been to school and done well at maths who, who can become the treasurer. And it's absolutely right that there's, just because they haven't got a formal qualification doesn't mean they can't play those roles. And we need to equip them both with the, a, a clear understanding of what that role involves and also give them the status that they, they deserve for playing that role. So we can, we can, you know, once you're called a treasurer, then you're the person who will receive training on financial accounting and so on and, and so on. So we can help build up the organizational structures even without all of the formal qualifications. And that's a very important point. Um, Kanimang has also made another point that using visualization and translation of those uh, form sheets in the local language helps a lot. So yes, so maybe when you've decided to take some actions to improve your business, you need somebody to draw something, to describe visually what uh, the change is that you're going to make and then describe it in the local language so that if you have a, a general meeting of all the farmers in the group, everyone can see, oh yes, I understand why we're going to do that. And I can hear what's being done in my own language. So thank you very much, Kanimang, that's very helpful. Oh, <laughs> so Johnny has asked a, a difficult question, which is the more staff, the more funds the, the FFPO needs for human resources. How many staff at a minimum should an FFPO have to run all these business incubation service systems? Could it be done by only one business manager? And I think um, most of the processes which we've described in this training uh, aren't costly in terms of paying experts or paying staff. They do require people to put a little bit of time into going through a process. Um, so I think if you're thinking larger FFPOs often pay staff to take up particular positions. So when you are running a very big business, you're often making a lot of profit and you decide, well, one of the challenges is that our current business manager isn't really capable of doing the job. So we're going to pay for a professional business manager to run the business part of our, our organization's uh, work. Uh, and you may pay a business manager, you may pay people to manage the technology, you may pay people to market the products. So when you've got very big, then you can afford to staff but I think many of these roles can take place, even if they're unpaid roles um, in, an, in the early stages of a forest and farm producer organization. And the risk management process that I've described, I think can be done at any level, even if the staff are just voluntarily doing the exercise and the only income they have is when they sell their own farm products through the group. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Well, listen, we're almost at the end of time. So um, I've got a little bit of homework for you. You've been very good at doing your homework. So I hope 
I hope this is also being useful for you uh, in helping to, to go back over the materials and to make them practical so that they can actually be used um, when you get home. So let me share my screen one last time and set the homework for today. So what I'd like you to do today is to take the three main risks that you prioritized uh, through your risk rank ranking exercise yesterday and brainstorm yourself, think up what are one or two things that we could do to manage this risk or to solve this problem. And when you think about that, if you've got a particular forest and farm organization in mind, think, well, who should, who should be responsible for doing that in that organization? And then think, how long would it take? Could we set a deadline? Is this something that we can do within a few days or is it going to take a whole year? Um, and finally, answer that question that was raised in the chat, who is responsible for monitoring progress and what they should look for? Okay. Is everybody um, clear about the homework? So the homework is going to be um, using the three risks. How are you going to, what do you propose as a solution for that challenge? How are you going to manage that risk? Who is going to be assigned responsibility for it? Then roughly how long should it take? Put in a deadline. So if you think of today's date um, in, in January, 2022, when is the deadline for solving that problem? And then who, who in your group would be best placed to manage, to monitor the progress and what should they look for? Is, that, is everyone clear on that? Let me just stop the sharing and um, maybe uh, uh, Ali, if you can um, just put the homework into the chat, can you do that? Is that something that's possible to do? Yeah, I've been emailing it after each session as well. So. Okay, yeah. so you've got those questions. Um, for those of you who didn't, haven't been able to um, take part so far, I think, um, uh, was it Miller? I, I can't remember, Professor Miller or somebody from Ghana. Um, if you haven't been able to join us so far, what we did was we tried to get you to identify risks in the area of, in six areas yesterday. So financial risks, natural resource risks, uh, customer uh, transport and customer risks, staff capacity risks, uh, legislation risks, and brand and reputation risk. And then we, we ask you to, to say which of these is a, a real problem for us, a big impact if we don't solve this problem, and how likely, how much do we need to solve that problem this year? So the scale of consequences and the necessary, the, 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 the need to solve it in this year, and we use that to rank the risks so that we had a list of three priority risks this morning. So if you go through that exercise and then use your three risks to develop a risk management plan, that's what we're doing, but we're just doing it with three risks, three challenges, and, and to get you un to understand the process. Any last questions? In which case, um, I'm so pleased to have been able to share this time with you. I thank you all for um, participating so actively, especially in the morning session and then throughout asking interesting questions and making interesting comments and giving interesting advice. Uh, so thank you all for your participation. Tomorrow, we're going to stop the general thinking about risk and focus in on climate risk and what are some options that we can think about putting in place with our producer organizations to become more resilient to climate change. So from risk to resilience, and that starts tomorrow.